Hello to everyone and welcome to our program on baseball. Good evening to those joining in the US and Ohio gozaimasu to our friends in Japan. My name is Paul Pass and I'm the executive director of the Japan America Society of Dallas Fort Worth, which is co-presenting this event with Japan Society. We are excited to share that we have we had had so we have over 240 people registered for this event from 25 states and 6 countries. Special thanks to Kazuo Kato and the entire Japan Society team for their hard work on this event. Before we proceed, I would like us to note that just last week marked 75 years since the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Although we cannot change the past, we can look at the great strides made in US-Japan relations since World War II and the fact that now the two countries have one of the strongest bilateral alliances in the world. On a related note, we have all been affected by COVID-19 and we wish everyone safety and health during this uncertain time. In our current global situation, it is essential that we continue to communicate across borders and cultures, as well as within our own communities. Our program is part of achieving this goal. Lastly, I wanted to go over some suggestions to maximize your experience. If there are technical issues, such as you are unable to hear the presenters, then please use the chat function. If you, if you have questions during the event, please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to ask early since we may not be able to address all questions. We also appreciate if you can share your first name or given name, as well as where you are from within your question. Please note, note that this webinar will be recorded and we plan to upload to YouTube soon. Now I would like to invite Josh, Joshua Walker, President and CEO of Japan Society to give some remarks. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Konbanwa to everyone on the East Coast and on the US and Ohio uh, to Japan. As Paul said, uh, I'm really excited as the new president of Japan Society to be doing this in partnership with my good friend, Paul. Uh, I think this is the type of connections that we need right now in COVID, whether you're in New York or Dallas or San Francisco or Tokyo or even Connecticut, where our panelists are coming from. Uh, there's one thing that unites us all, which is uh, our love of sports and baseball in particular, which has a special place, as you'll learn tonight, uh, between the US and Japan. Uh, we couldn't be more excited to be partnering. We're stronger together when we do this. There are 38 other Japan societies around the United States, of which New York and Dallas are only two, but we hope to be leading the way with this type of programming. So thank you for all of you that are joining. Thanks for all those friends that are out there. Uh, and, and I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Joshua. Uh, and all of us around the world appreciate your leadership in this challenging time. Now I would like to briefly introduce our panelists and moderator. We will share a link for more extensive bios in the chat box later. Jason Koskri is a sports writer and editor with the Japan Times, where he has worked since 2007. A native of Michigan, he mainly writes on Nippon professional baseball, and he has covered the Japan, it's the Japanese national baseball team during the World Baseball Classic. Matt Merton is currently a baseball operations assistant with the Chicago Cubs. He also played professionally in the US with the Cubs among other teams, but arguably he achieved his greatest success in Japan where he starred for the Hanshin Tigers. He was named to several best nine teams. And in 2010, he broke the NPB's single season hit record with 214 hits, a mark previously held by Ichiro Suzuki. Bobby Valentine is currently the Director of Athletics at Sacred Heart University. He played professional baseball in the U.S. for 10 seasons, and after his playing career, he became a manager, first with the Texas Rangers and later with the New York Mets, which he led to a World Series appearance in 2000. In the mid-1990s, he became manager of the NPB's Chiba Lotte Marines and became a local icon. He would eventually return to the Marines and win the Japan Series in 2005. Our moderator for this evening is Yuriko Gamal Romer, who is an award-winning director. Her titles include Mrs. Judo, Be Strong, Be Gentle, Be Beautiful, and Diamond Diplomacy, from which we will see a clip in a few minutes. Yuriko, please feel free to begin. Thank you, Paul, and uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, let's see, we're going to start this with a short work in progress sneak preview of Diamond Diplomacy, which sort of uh, outlines the history of US-Japan relations through baseball. So why don't we start there? If anyone is interested in more information about the film, you can go to diamonddiplomacy.com. Let's see, let me do this 
Yes. Okay. Civil War veteran from Maine came to Japan to teach in Tokyo and at recess he taught his students a game with the bat and the ball. His name was Horace Wilson and in case you didn't notice he came from Red Sox Nation. <laughs> The 34 team was one of the greatest squads ever brought together at that date. There was over a million people to welcome Babe Ruth when he entered Tokyo. When the tour finished, Connie Mack proclaimed it the greatest diplomatic mission of all time. There was such an outpouring of goodwill, but it was fleeting. Few Americans knew Japan. We had opened Japan to the Western world. They had bought our machines, copied our architecture, and had even adopted our games. Although they marched to the baseball diamond as men marching to war. Oh my goodness alive. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, my father, he started grabbing everything that he could put his hands on, throwing everything out the window. It was just absolutely mayhem. It really did help bring the two countries closer together. General MacArthur called it the greatest piece of diplomacy ever. Sayonara, sayonara, ki ni arete yo Mashi was the only Japanese player for 30 years. In a big year, and they needed a certain type of player. And the rest is history. The two year deal turned into seven years. First two seasons was very, very tough, especially the first season with all this hoopla. This guy's coming from the major league, he's 31, oh, he's this, he's making all this money, writing bad, bad things about me. There had been this really bitter trade dispute between Japanese and Americans. Japanese exports were flooding the United States. There's this bitter war of words between the two countries. But then no more happened. A young pitcher named Hideo Nomo, he's signed by the Los Angeles Dodgers. So once Nomo excelled, it opened the door for other Japanese players. You know, we speak a different language, but like it's just cool to understand this culture and, and just to learn different attitudes and mindsets. I love uh, sashimi, I love sushi, I mean, sake. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bobby. So now we're going to hear for some.
some people who can talk directly to playing baseball in Japan, managing and coaching baseball in Japan, and also from Jason, who will tell us a little bit more from the media perspective of what's going on today. So first I'm going to ask something that uh, I think maybe all of you might want to respond to. Uh, what are some major impressions of the differences and the similarities between MPB and MLB? And for those of you who don't know, MPB is Nippon Professional Baseball. And I think everyone knows that Major League Baseball is MLB. So, and if, please feel free to comment on your area of expertise or, or whatever you feel the need to talk about. Bobby, you're on screen. You want to answer that one for us? Oh, well, I thought I was going to be third. Um, you know, the game itself is very similar. The, it, the ball that's pitched, the ball that's hit, um, high quality of play. You know, the preparation is different, of course. You know, you on the road, you dress in the hotel, and uh, the, the lavish – clubhouses and locker rooms aren't the place that players hang out and spend most of their day. They spend it at the, the hotel. Um, you know, Japan is a food society and, um, you know, Major League uh, Baseball there revolves around making sure that the food is, is uh, served properly, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for guys who are on the road. And, you um, you know, they carry 28 men on a roster, similar to the way they're doing it now in the major leagues in the COVID situation. But uh, you get to uh, designate three that aren't active each game. They're usually starting pitchers. So you have this large group of bullpen pitchers usually that take you through 12 innings, which is another difference that they have ties, of course, in Japan, which is a great idea that they should do in the MLB also. Um, other than that, you know, they worked at a 3-2 count, and the three the, the balls and strikes are in reverse order when they're on the scoreboard and when they're, when they're called by the announcers to the umpires. It's two, ball, uh, two strikes and three balls rather than three balls and two strikes. Um, and you don't spit on the field. You don't mess up the dugout. You, uh, you think of the field as a sacred place to work and play. And uh, everyone takes the game a little more seriously there, both the fans, the, um, the umpires, and, and many of the umpires are ex-baseball players themselves, as a matter of fact. They actually practice during spring training, which is really different because uh, you never see a major league umpire practicing his trade. So, uh, you know, uh, other than that, I think uh, Matt will tell you, the game is pretty similar. They have to hit hit some pretty good pitching. You have to field it. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a real high level of play. Well, Matt, let's hear from you. Let's hear from the player. What do you think about the similarity difference thing? Yeah, just to touch on a few of the things that Bobby shared, which was tremendous, by the way, and it's an honor to be here and a part of this panel. Um, but uh, when we talk about the similarities, um, very simply, uh, the, the amount is still 60 feet, six inches. The plate is still 17 inches wide. And the goal is still to create runs and prevent runs. So the object of the game never changes. And Bobby kind of alluded to that. It's like, you know, at the end of the day, when you're competing as an athlete between a batter and a, and a, uh, and a pitcher, uh, inevitably that ball has to come down to home plate. And your, ob your objective of squaring that ball up really isn't different, regardless of where on the, on the globe you're playing the game. So whether you're in Japan or the U.S. or uh, anywhere else for that matter, in Latin America, around the world, the object is still to hit that baseball. Now, as Bobby uh, touched on a little bit, and in many ways, that's where the game kind of, kind of, uh, it, it differentiates itself between the Japanese game and the NPB and the American game. And um, one of the things that was interesting Bobby touched on was certainly the idea of um, not having an ability to shower and change in the clubhouse before you come back to the hotel. And I find that very interesting because that was something that you had to get used to. I felt like I had gone back to my college days in a sense. And uh, there were times where it was like bus in 10 minutes after the game, the game's over, final out, we're on a bus. And you're coming back into these nice hotels with dirt all over your uniforms and foreign people uh, are seeing you, people from outside of Japan. And I swear they would look at us 
And here's these guys trying to play professional baseball at a really high level. And these guys are looking at you like you're a part of a men's league. So <laughs> it's definitely one of those things where it's like, you know, you take a step back in a way um, in regards to um, some of, so, like, like Bobby mentioned, some of the clubhouses and, and uh, some of the environments that you're placed in. And that, that also speaks to the culture. So there's so many things we could talk about tonight, but um, certainly uh, uh, one of the other things that really stands out to me is the batter pitcher matchup in terms of how uh, pitchers attack hitters. So the, the pitchers are much more willing to throw a tough pitch in a 2-1 count, maybe their strikeout pitch, where in the United States, they're still attacking the zone. So in the United States, it's attack the zone early, expand late, and in Japan, they'll expand from the first pitch. So there's certainly a lot of adjustments that have to occur um, as it pertains to playing on the field. Jason, how about you, since you're writing about all this and, Well, that one other thing, I, I don't want to jump in. Sure. Yeah, but before we go, just also, the minor league system is also a major difference. <clears throat> and the major leagues here uh, in the States are trying to eliminate a lot of minor league teams, where every major league team usually has seven or eight different minor league teams. In Japan, there's only one minor league. And don't get to develop in the minor leagues the way you get to develop in the minor leagues here in the States. Go, Jason. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think for me, just being in the stands, uh, the fans, the atmosphere of the game, it's, it's totally different. And it's, it's very much organized. You see the people cheering. They have their songs for each different player. And so I, I think that's a big difference. Um, looking on the field, you see a lot more bunts in Japan than, than you do in the U.S. And like, you know, Bobby and Matt are, are much better suited to say. You see the differences in how the games are played. But I think more to me, it's, it's the culture. You see the, the seriousness that you know, even the fans have about the game. And you see how, how the society also reveres the, the lower levels of the game as far as high school and college because, like, Waseda University, Kale University, they pack Jingu Stadium. That's tradition, and that's – it's not just about the professional game here. People love baseball. People love the high school game, amateur game. So I think for me it's just the atmosphere of games is totally different and just the seriousness, seriousness the fans have about the game as well. Okay. Well, first, I, I want to tell the audience that Bobby's video is a little shaky, but we're really lucky to have him because he has no power and he is sitting in his car and we have him joining us on Zoom through his phone. So we're lucky to have Bobby. Okay, so let's see next. Um, well, you saw in my clip that Nori Aoki was in, um, he played seven years in the MLB, actually seven different teams, I think. And he's currently back in Japan and plays for the, uh, the Swallows. One of the things that he said and he felt strongly about was that he wanted to see the best of the U.S. in Japan and the best of Japan in the U.S. So let's see, let's start with Matt this time. Um, can you think of something that you would want to share of, of American baseball in Japan or vice versa? And if you have an anecdote that you want to share to that note? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, there's a lot of things that come to mind when you hear that. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Bobby, I'm sure he'll have a chance. Hopefully his, his uh, audio and stuff's working well, but he'll have a chance to probably speak more from a managerial standpoint and the organization of how practices are put together and how that varies. But just from a player's perspective, um, one of the things that certainly stands out, and it's really hard to experience um, – baseball in another country without culture being a big part of it. And so when we talk about how you would like to see things uh, transfer both from Japan to the U.S. and vice versa, one of the things that really stood out to me in Japan is the, I, the idea of unity and wa and the group mentality. So as we went through our training, as we went through our practices, uh, they were much more group oriented in how we went about stretching and taking our uh, infield outfield work and going through our hitting routines. Um, and, and that gave us gave a sense of checking self. Um, look, we all have egos. We all have we want to succeed. We all want to be the best at what we do. But the Japanese did a very good job of being able to uh, uh, suppress that in a sense or be able to internalize that in such a way that the group was always supposed to be more important than the one individual. 
So, you know, it's like anything else in life. Like, I mean, that can be a very good thing. And, and as I share here, it can also be something that kind of can hinder you as well. Um, as it pertains to the United States, does a very good job of allowing individuals to become uh, more artistic in how they express themselves. Um, the individual uh, programs that they are put on to help uh, push them and move them forward is really, really good. Um, I do wish that in the U.S. there were times where we did a better job of the identity of unity and WA, as it were, and how we work with one another. Especially at the major league level, we've become very uh, much about self and what do I need to do to get my contract. And really what this comes down to, we all play this game because the ultimate goal is to win baseball games. And it's a team sport. Um, and now on the flip side of that, vice versa of that, for, the, for the, what I would bring back from the United States, is the encouraging the athletes in Japan to be willing to uh, think outside of the box. So there's, there's chances and opportunities for these guys to be able to stretch themselves and maybe grow in ways that they're not comfortable growing because they're just so used to doing it just one way. Um, and so you can never forget, as a Japanese, you can never forget, and Americans too, you can never forget where you came from. You gotta, you gotta remember that, that you are Japanese and this is how we play the game and there's nothing wrong with that. The history of the game is tremendous. However, there's also gonna be these opportunities that will, that will come up that we can stretch ourselves and we can grow. And so for them, I would encourage them. And one example of that is stretch, and I'll leave it at this. So most of the time we stretch together. Stretches are pretty exhaustive. They go on for a while, a lot longer than they do in the US. Um, but it's a team-oriented stretch. On occasion now in Japan, as we transition and uh, the generationally speaking, we become more global in how we communicate and technology. I think the younger generations are starting to become more open to uh, what the rest of the world does. And so on occasion, they would give us what they call a, an o, your own program, OP, so that guys could go out and stretch on their own. Well, whenever they gave us the opportunity for 10 or 15 minutes to go out and stretch on our own, everybody started looking around in Japan. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? They didn't know what to do. They, they kind of had to follow what their friends were doing or what, what somebody else was doing. Or if the stretch was going to be at a certain time, nobody would look at their clock and follow the stretch time. All of a sudden, one person gets up, the whole room gets up. So like there's, they, they kind of limit themselves in my perspective in a way of their ability to stretch and grow. And so you can hear, I guess, how both cultures could utilize the other to help, um, to help kind of come to the middle, if you would. Did you ever find a time when you as a player were being told to, to just held down or to go with the program or? Um, yeah, I mean, look, at the end of the day, it could be a long conversation, but yeah, there's always going to be times where I think when you first get there, it's like a honeymoon phase. And it's kind of like you're understood to be the, the dumb foreigner, the one that doesn't understand the culture. And so you kind of are forgiven for a lot of things. The longer you're there, the more is expected. And we could go into a long conversation on that. But there does come a point where, and it's always, it's, look, at the end of the day, it's part of our responsibility. We are being hired. They're taking good care of us. We are very grateful to the country. And that goes both ways. This game of baseball brings us together. And the opportunity for us to come together and be in somebody else's country, we need to make sure that we try to adhere to their, to their standards and their rules. So, yes, there is a little bit of that, but that's life, right? Okay. Yeah. Now, Jason, how about um, you from the media perspective, sort of from a what, – what did – can you think of anything that that you would like to see brought to either country from the other? Well, from, from I guess selfishly, from a media perspective, I would like to see us like access wise because in America, you know, before the games, you can talk to the you can go talk to the manager, you can go and you can go in the clubhouse and things like that. And here in Japan, you really can't do that. You know, few people can talk to the manager if he decides to sit on the bench and do a little session and then he's gone and you, you really don't get much from them after that. Although I must say, Bobby was very good about talking before games, which I always appreciated very much. And, um, but yeah, you don't get that sort of same sort of access to the players. Like after games, uh, if they, if they want to stop, they're going to, they'll stop and talk to you. And a lot of guys are really good about that. And if they don't, then you, you got to walk with them. And that can be precarious sometimes in, in Cebu Dome. There's just, this mile of stairs you have to walk up while you're trying to talk to somebody in a group of people. I actually was going up and up and down, up and down the stairs and I almost tripped and I kind of caught myself and stopped myself from knocking Masahiro Tanaka down because we we're in a group of like 10 people trailing him up, up some stairs, downstairs, around stairs and stairs that kind of curve. And so I would like the, the media 
I think set up in America is much better than in Japan. And as far as vice versa, um, I think I would say what Matt said, as far as I would like to see more outside of the box thinking in Japan. I, and I, I do actually think it's getting a lot better here. I don't know if anyone saw the, the Koshien documentary that was aired in ESPN on ESPN there, but there was a scene near the end where the Hanamaki Higashi high school coach tells his players that we're done for right now, go get some lunch. None of the moves. And then he, he looks back at him and says, look, go, you know, don't just wait for your teammate to go, you know, go on your own and, you know, don't take the initiative. And I think the kind of thing basically Matt was talking about. So I think it is changing somewhat, which is good. And I'd like to see that more. Bobby? Yeah, you know, that access thing, Jason always did get access, by the way, and he's a spectacular reporter for all of those who are uh, meeting Jason for the first time. Um, but, you know, to get into the clubhouse, uh, U.S. reporters are actually experiencing a, J a Japanese uh, situation now where they don't have access, where everything is orchestrated on Zoom for pregame and postgame interviews. And you only get the manager for a certain amount of time and only get a few of the stars of the game. And um, uh, they're finding it a real, really difficult way to uh, bring the game to the fans. I, I tried to bring the game to the fans and get as much access as possible. A lot of my players, you know, for my, uh, did say, but it's difficult because the structure doesn't allow it. As Jason says, you got to get on that bus. I think there's 186 steps that you have to go up and down at the Cebu Dome. So when the game's over, you have to go up those four flights of stairs to get on the, on the bus, and there's no stopping on your way up or your way down. So, uh, yeah, more access would be good even though I think the Japanese press does a great job of covering. And if they don't have the access, they make it up pretty well. What about like they from do the in management? The States, by the way, nothing different there. What about from the management? Well, the management, the management structure is so much different because again, as I mentioned, there's only one minor league team. So the idea of the corporate structure of an MLB team where you have uh, farm directors and scouting directors and managers at every different level and coaches at every different level, it's hard to have continuity within the organization. Many organizations struggle at getting the same thing, this is in the States, the same thing taught at the major league level as it's being taught at the rookie league level because it has to go through so many different people who have their own individual way of teaching a certain message. And I know we're getting better at that here, but um, there the, 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 the organization is, is pretty, a pretty uh, close knit structure and the marketing department and the sales department is, is a smaller, uh, less sophisticated uh, operation in Japan because a lot of the teams are still use the, the team as their advertising vehicle, not as their, their standalone business. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's just, Uh-oh, did we lose you, Bobby? I think we might oh, have Oh, did I that. freeze? No, oh. I'm still here. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, so let's see. At this point, maybe we should move on. And I've got some uh, questions for Matt. Um, as a former player, you can, I think you can talk more directly to things like, um, let's see, two, there were two non-Japanese players, sluggers, famously tied Sadaharu O's um, single season home run record in the 2000s. However, there was a belief that they did not receive any good pitches once they tied the mark. And there are even stories about non-Japanese players having completely different um, strike zones. So as a player, what was your experience, especially when you were when you broke Ichiro's single season hit record in 2010. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so um, 
more than anything, I think when you kind of come down to the end uh, of a season um, of which you have been able to um, accomplish a lot of a lot of things as an individual. I mean, there's a lot that goes into that. Number one, it's an opportunity. You have to have the opportunity to play the game. And number two, it, it really has a lot to do with the people around you that have helped prepare you, teammates that have put you up there. So to put it in perspective really quickly before I get into it, you have to be able to go to the plate over 600 times. Uh, and I hit 349 that year to be able to get to that number. So the idea of being able to hit high in the order, stay healthy, have, an, uh, have a manager that runs you out there every day, and then a lineup offensively that, op that does a lot of good things that create those opportunities is, is paramount. Um, as it came down to that time period uh, of, of the potential of breaking the record, I'll say more than anything, probably a week leading into it, I started feeling a good bit of pressure um, to the point where I felt like if I didn't succeed in this way, that I would be a failure because it was sitting there right in front of me. And it seemed to be pretty attainable at the time only because I only needed X amount of hits to get there with only so many games. Now we know in the game, failure comes and those offers come, you know, over 20s will happen. Um, but for you to finish on one of those type of stretches, uh, for that to be what stops you from getting there, it felt like it was going to be a failure. People have alluded to the fact that, um, you know, for those sluggers, I think it was Tuffy Rhodes in 2001 and uh, Cabrera, Alex Cabrera in 2002. Um, now again, Osan, uh, happened to be associated with both clubs late in the season that were either managing against or uh, had, had, had something to do with that. I think he did go on record as saying we want to pitch to them and possibly the pitching coaches became involved uh, because at the end of the day, Osan uh, was a national treasure at this point. He was already uh, a legendary figure in, in the game of baseball in Japan. Um, he uh, has been recognized, uh, you know, by the National Baseball Hall of Fame. This guy is, is, is 868 home runs, um, the worldwide home run mark. So, you know, we're talking about one of the key figures in Japanese baseball. Um, so that carries a ton of weight. Now, not that Ichiro wasn't um, somebody that was revered, um, but again, Ichiro was still playing. He was younger. I think the home run record held a certain kind of, like, uh, air to it, maybe more so than even the hit record. And then the last piece I would say to that is that people told me, whether it's true or not, that when Ichiro crossed the Pacific and came over to America and had an opportunity to break our single season, our being Major League Baseball, the United States, where I was born and came from, to break that particular record, uh, it kind of opened their eyes in a sense. Um, that, you know, this game is a game that is a little bit more global. And our guys are having an opportunity to go over to the United States and play in the major leagues and be able to set these type of records. So I think that because of the way the world is getting smaller and technology and all these things, maybe people started to see that. And, and it, you know, I think there's a number of factors at play. The last thing I'll say is they certainly didn't make it easy. I don't feel like at any point in time they were trying to purposely pitch around me or not allow me to do it. But like any competitor, any good competitor, when you're in an environment like that and you've got a guy at the plate who's been succeeding, you want to get him out. So they, they made it very difficult. The way the pitch sequencing was and how they would tippy toe around the edges of the plate. I was lucky enough. This is the last thing I'll say. And going back to the idea of team and unity. I felt pressure. I remember in my at-bats leading up to it, I started pulling off pitches more than I would. And I was really kind of use the middle of the field, stay behind the ball, use the big part of the field, what allowed me to have success. And I'll never forget the at-bat that I was able to set the record was in Jingu, at, uh, at Jingu Kyujo uh, against the Swallows. And it was off of a, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a pitch, it was a hitter's count and it was a changeup that was elevated. But the situation was bases loaded and one out. And I just remember telling myself, in this circumstance, my job as a hitter is not to get a hit, it's to drive this guy in from third base. And in order for me to drive this guy in from third base to help my team win, we were in the middle of a playoff run, I've got to stay in the big part of the field. So the idea of I've just got to knock this guy in from third in an RBI situation, just get that guy in from third, took the pressure off me to have to get this hit, and all of a sudden I was able to get the knock. But I would say, to kind of like wrap that up, I would say that, yes, I, I do think that there's a lot of factors at play. I never felt like they were like intentionally trying to keep me from it, but they certainly made me earn it. Okay, on a slightly different subject, um, I know that you've just started a nonprofit and do you want to give us a, a, a quick rundown on what you're doing? Because it's an interesting project. 
Yeah, I'll make it. Re- I'll try to make it really quick. So um, one of the things I think as uh, as athletes, um, when you have an opportunity to experience um, what we did in Japan, um, it, you realize um, just how grateful you are. From the age of 28 to basically 34, I was able to extend my career at a time where I really was kind of up and down in the major leagues and uh, hadn't been, I didn't have that opportunity to go out and run out there and get those 600 at bats. So they provided the country of Japan, the Hanshin Tigers provided that opportunity to go out and get 600 at bats and be there for six years. And we have memories as a family um, that we will carry with us uh, for the rest of our lives. Uh, We feel forever connected to the Japanese culture and people. And because of that, out of a heart of gratitude, um, starting in 2018, which was the first year I wasn't playing anymore, um, we started going back. Um, there was a number of people within Japan um, that have been super instrumental in connecting uh, and creating a network of people who want to continue to engage the communities and try to use it for a positive manner. Um, so we've been back doing clinics and hosting events for charitable stuff with the Kodomo Shukudo Network. And the first year we were back, they had the, uh, the um, typhoon that had come in and, and created some flooding issues there in Kansai. Um, There was the earthquake in Osaka as well. And then obviously this last year up in Chiba. Um, So it's been really cool to be able to utilize that platform. Um, So this this, uh, nonprofit that you mentioned is merely out of a sense of kind of like grassroots or organic in in a way, there's no agenda. Um, It's gonna, it's the name of it's called FASA. And what we hope to do through it, it's a foreign athlete support association And the hope with this project is basically to continue to engage the community and engage the current athletes. So we, we, uh, there's a network of people that have helped connect even the guys in Kansai uh, to help the foreign athletes become more uh, uh, comfortable in their setting, uh, to provide resources for them, to help them both on and off the field. And so trying to love and take care of the guys that are there now, which honestly is just kind of in the, in the beginning stages. Um, And then use that to, to, in terms of sustainable effort, to continue to engage their community through the game of baseball. So very simply, it's just a cool way to be able to try to give back um, and in a way that it can be organized and people can get behind it. Because as we said, WA and unity and group is very important. So we had to try to create a group, yeah. I think that's wonderful. You're a cultural ambassador. I don't know about that, but I love the game. I love, I love both, obviously both countries and we're lucky enough that that game brings us together. It's wonderful. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit. Jason, you are the one that kind of knows what's going on today. And especially given the COVID-19 situation, um, let's see, can you, we're going to ask you to talk a little bit more about what's going on. So what's being done to ensure player safety in the NPB in Japan? And how do the NPB players, how are they handling things like travel? And uh, here in San Francisco, we saw Buster Posey um, opt out. And there are some players that are doing this to, for their own safety and their family's safety. And so how does uh, MPB, M- NPB and MLB differ in the way they've been addressing this uh, COVID pandemic? Well, I know MPB, they're doing a lot, there's a lot of testing going on. They're testing guys, I think at least once a month, maybe twice a month, but for sure they're testing them once a month and doing the, trying to, if they do have any infections, trying to see who that person's been around, who that person's been in contact with. Although there haven't been many infections, there's basically, there was a farm team player for the Fukuoka Sopping Hawks, um, Hasegawa Yuya, who was a former batting champion, actually, but he got it, but he hadn't been in contact with the top team. So they're doing that. And then they're, you know, once they have found the, the few infections that they have found, which most were in the spring, quarantine those guys, and you can't come back until you've had a couple of negative tests. And they're testing players. They're trying to keep them separated on the road in hotels. They're trying to make sure they're, they're staying properly distanced from the fans, which there are only a few fans in the stadiums now. And they've asked people not to approach them. Um, if they see them like going to and from the Shinkansen or in the airport, you know, please don't approach us, don't ask for autographs, that sort of thing to kind of keep social distancing. They're also um, 
doing things with the media, like as we talked about access before. Now we're also doing a lot of, some teams are doing things on Zoom. Some teams are doing things where basically you just got to stand pretty far back from the player or the manager and they're limiting how many media can come into some of the stadiums. So I think they're probably doing a lot of the same things in America and the players, as far as they responded, they, you know, they responded well. They, it hasn't really changed much for them on the field. And I know it's changed a few, a little for them off the field. I know some of the foreign players have said they haven't, been able to get together the way they usually do during the season. But so far, um, I think MPB has done a, a, a decent job at at least addressing it. And there's a task force that they are going through with the J League, the soccer league in Japan, and they have a medical panel. So they're getting advice from that as well and following government guidelines and the advice of their medical panel. Well, I know that one big difference between Japan and the U.S. is that MPB is allowing some fans into the stadium. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, there's, um, I think it was July, it was in the middle of July for sure. They, they started allowing 5, 000, up to 5,000 fans can come into games. And I don't, I'm not sure any team has actually hit 5,000 yet, but they, and some teams could cap it more. The Hawks for a couple of the games capped it at way lower than 5,000. So the maximum was 5,000, but you didn't have to have 5,000. But it was supposed to have gone up to half of each stadium's capacity on August the 1st, but Japan has started to see kind of a second wave of infections and the numbers were spiking a little bit. So they pushed that back until now, until at least September, it's going to still be only 5,000 people can, a max of 5,000 people can attend games. And the people who can attend the games are asked to not do the usual cheering that you hear at Japanese games. So that there's no there's no cheering sections in the outfield. There's no no loud cheering. They actually made a I, th I believe there was a the PA announcer had to come on in at Koshien and tell the fans that you have to be a little bit more quiet. You can't yell and this kind of thing. So they're still allowing fans, but they're trying they're putting restrictions on them. So it's not biz exactly business as usual in that sense. And I guess we'll see what the medical panel and the government says about large gatherings as far as whether they'll be more in September. Okay, well, thank you. So yeah, and folks, if folks who are out there for whatever that's worth, one of, the, one of the spectacular events that ever happened, Matt got to do it in all of his home games, was during that seventh inning time, at Koshien, when multiple balloons were blown up by every one of the 50,000 people in the stands, and the balloons were released in the air and cleaned up in about a minute and a half, that that is not happening at a, a Japanese baseball game is, is really tragic. The Tigers actually replaced the balloons with towels, with balloon pictures of the jet balloons on this. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Bobby, we're going to switch gears again. So not many people out there know about your, um, your history with Japan long before you managed the MPB. So can you share your stories about that and how you eventually ended up with the Marines? Whoa. In just a minute, that'd be real tough. You know, in high school, I played the lead in a play. It was the tea house of the August moon. I was the Japanese interpreter. I spoke Japanese as a 16 year old on stage in my high school. As I said, I, I wore the Mizuno glove. I was a guest of the Mizuno family in the eighties. I got to do clinics with Sada Hara o, who's already been mentioned in Nagashima-san and, uh, and Nomura-san and other great Japanese uh, managers and ex-players uh, back in the 80s so that we were sharing ideas. I, I went over and talked about the pitch count in 1986. If you can imagine that, that the Japanese baseball community was actually interested in limiting the pitches or at least wondering how I was limiting the pitches in Texas as I was a young manager. And um, you know, and, and so, so many other things that uh, I'm thankful that I was the first uh, non-Japanese to manage in the Japanese league. Um, uh, I, I owe, as Matt mentioned, I owe a good deal of my life to the, uh, to the fans and to the organization of the Chibalote Marines uh, that, that made my life so enjoyable while I was there. Well, you are one... I think you, you might be the only one, but I, you are definitely one of the f fewest that have experienced 
the World Series, both in Japan and in the United States. You want to give us a little bit on what might be a similar or different or? Well, the excitement is really similar. There's no doubt about that. Um, and the, the difference is I won in Japan and I lost in the States. Um, you know, but one of those things that needs to be uh, understood is, is, and Matt was mentioning and alluding it to it, is that um, in Japan, there's a respect for the leadership. And in, in order to win at anything, what you need to do is have teamwork. That was wow, that, that Matt was also mentioning. But in order to have true teamwork, you have to have trust in the leadership. And the problem we are experiencing here in the States, um, getting through COVID and actually moving on ahead the way we should, is that there is not teamwork because there is not trust. And, and I just, you know, tip my hat to the Japanese community, to the way they trust the leadership of the team and the leadership of their community. That uh, That's what gets that team working together to to get a win well i know um and oh by the way the other difference is when you win when you win the championship in japan the way that they the symbolic gesture is take the manager and throw them in the end and they catch them. The, reason, the players have to trust the manager and after you win, the manager has to trust the players, if you know what I mean. Okay. Well, that is one of the big difference about what's going on with this COVID thing is that the U.S. has been having some player owner differences and that doesn't really happen quite as often in Japan, but is that part of the culture you think or Yeah, lack of culture. In which place? Yeah, in, in the U.S., obviously. You know, in, in order to have culture, you need to have, you have to have systems, systems that are accepted as part of the culture. Our individuality in the States has kept us from developing the systems that are needed to have a proper culture that we could define and, and follow. I just had a phone phone call coming in on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, I mean, that's what I think. I, that's what I think and um, it's just what it is. Okay, let's see, Bobby, one more question for you. Okay. You were kind of a big celebrity in Japan. I know there's a beer that was named after you and there's a street named after you and, and so on and so forth. So how, how was that? Was it, uh, and how did it affect your, your everyday duties as, as manager? Well, I, I actually went to Sapporo and tried to see if they would name a beer after me and charge a little more for it and give the extra money to a charity that I was uh, running there for a uh, wayward home uh, situation in Japan and Sapporo Beer did it. Interestingly enough, the person who owned Sapporo Beer at the time is now a dear friend of mine here in the United States, Warren Lichtenstein, but he didn't know what he was doing at the time dealing with me. Uh, they in the street after me because I went to the governor before the season started and I said, listen, the governor is going to be when we win the championship or one championship they parade route. And so down the line of buildings where I lived, they had a parade site and they named that street Valentine Way, uh, interestingly enough, forever. So um yeah, and, and Shoriki, who put together that 1934 series that you have in your documentary, um, I, am, I am the only American to win that Shoriki Award uh, for doing things for Japanese baseball. It's one of the greatest honors that I ever received. 
I imagine that you still attract some attention when you go to Japan today. Is that true? Did we lose you? Yeah, I, you know, yeah, they want to know why I have such gray hair. Because <laughs> I dyed it when I was there, of course. <laughs> okay, well, I think we're, we're fairly wrapped up on the, um, the questions that I have here. And I think we have some audience generated questions. Is that right? Um, Okay, I've got a question from Shane Barkley from Santa Cruz, California. And Shane is the Japan ball baseball tour guy. And he wants for Jason, how does your Gaijin status affect your ability to cover MPV? Do, do or did you face some of the same challenges that Matt and Bobby faced during the MPV tenure? Probably, I probably did as far as, you know, the language barrier and that sort of thing. Cause you know, when I, when I came to Japan, I didn't speak Japanese at all. I didn't, I had never met anyone that had been to Japan. I don't think, I'm not sure. So, um, yeah, so I, I would go to, you know, a lot of Chiwalo Tamarin games. So I can talk to Bobby, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I probably, I think my status, you know, I think, I don't think it's been a particularly adverse effect to it. I mean, I guess, it's probably the same as in Matt where you, you kind of get away with some stuff because they just figure that you don't know. And I think it's probably the same sort of situation there. I'm, I'm, I've gone up and talked to some players that the other Japanese media, they knew that, oh, this guy doesn't really like to talk before a game or whatever. And I've just walked, I've walked up to him and he, I guess he probably stopped wondering like, who, who is this person? <laughs> and then people would ask me what he said, but that's one of those things like, you know, I didn't know, I had no idea, no one, no one told me. And I guess that's the, probably the biggest thing. Maybe there's stuff that people didn't tell you or don't tell you just because they figure you don't understand it or yeah, you're just, you're not one of the normal beat writers that they know. So I guess to wrap that up, um, I'm sure there have been positives to it. There've been negatives to it, but it, it kind of just is what it is. Sounds cool. Uh, let's see, a question from Wesley Rizal from Chicago, as a manager or player, what was your favorite team or city to play against and why? Go ahead, Matty. Okay, so for me, um, Jingu Stadium was always cool. It was a great place to hit. And I had some, I had, as we mentioned before, a really cool moment there. Um, also had a really tough moment there where I was pulled off the field in the middle of an inning because I missed the ball in the outfield. So uh, Jingu always has a spot for me, uh, both good and bad. Um, but in terms of, there's so many cool interactions. Uh, Bobby had the opportunity to manage at a place where it, it's very, uh, it's very, you know, evident or, or uh, obvious in the sense of the Tokyo Dome facing the Giants, the atmosphere in that stadium with those two teams playing each other. Um, great place to hit. It's where we won the, uh, Climax Series Final in 14 to advance the Nippon Series. Um, so I'd have to say probably the one that's closest to me is the Tokyo Dome. Bobby, do you have any favorites? Well, you know, Matt was really lucky. I thought the hollow ground of, uh, of uh, Koshien uh, Stadium where, where Matt played his home games. And, and of course, Wrigley Field in Chicago uh, were, were as cool a place as, as I ever experienced. And, you know, I felt at home in Chiba because the, fan, the fans were really special. The ballpark was anything but special, but the fans were very special. That sounds good. Okay, we have a question from Hiroki Takeuchi in Dallas for the panelists. Let's see, can you talk about the differences of the coach-player relationships? between MLB and MPB. Bobby, you want to take that one first? Go ahead, Matt. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, no, why don't you take it? No, either way. I mean, I'll make it real quick and then we'll let you go. So the biggest difference for me as a player, um, and, I'll, and I'll make this quick, Bobby alluded to it. Koshian Stadium uh, has a longstanding history of which the high school tournament um, is sacred. Um, and so the way that the high school athlete interacts with their coach is somewhat similar to how it occurs here. And what I noticed as an athlete, as a professional athlete at a higher level, 
that coach player relationship kind of found its way from high school to college all the way to the highest level in Japan, where there was much more uh, of an interaction with the coach from a standpoint of um, the coach is going to give you your, your uh, orders for the day and the player is going to adhere to the orders they were given. So much more of a, I don't know, respect is the right word, but a different type of interaction as it pertains to athlete and coach. Um, and you almost liken it to the high school days and how the player submits themselves to the coach. In the United States, there's obviously respect, but it's a totally different, totally different interaction. I'll just leave it at that. Bobby would know better than anybody. He did it on both sides. He did it as a player and as a, you know, playing the game and coaching. No, no you, you, you're, you're right, Matt. That's what it is. Both, both sides of the pond built that management style around the military style because they needed chain of command. They needed the, the troops to follow the orders because it was the general's head that was on the, on the cutting block. Um, the U.S. has gone from that a little, where it's not just my way or the highway. It's not the military style of, of discipline or, or respect that, that they deal with. In Japan, it still is um, one way, one person, the, the coach rules, and um, the interaction is not as, as friendly of an interaction as it is in the States, I think. A hundred percent, Bobby. I saw some things like even though I can't really teams, share it. Always but, was. Yeah. Yeah, I'm saying I'm sorry. I, I saw some things when I first came <laughs> to Japan that I can't really share, but I was like, oh my goodness, what's going on? I've never seen this before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're not afraid to get up in their face. Let's just leave Boot it at that. Camp. Yeah. Okay, I yes. got I've got a question here from Shoal for Matt Merton. Matt, can you talk about the curse of Colonel Sanders? Well, what I know of it um, <laughs> was back in, was it 1980, was it 85, 84, 85, right in there, um, when the uh, Tigers had gone on to uh, the Nippon Series, right? And uh, the Colonel was thrown after they had won. Uh, he was thrown into the river, my understanding, in Osaka. And ever since then, the, uh, the Tigers have yet to win a championship since that uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, so to put it, is, is very big in Japan, okay? And the Colonel, as it is, it, the statue of the Colonel stands out in front of most of these uh, establishments. So apparently the, the uh, party got a little crazy, the Colonel was taken, thrown into the river, and ever since then, the Tigers can't win. So uh, the story goes, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But now in Japan, all of the uh, colonels, uh, Sanders, are bolted to the ground. And they say the reason they're bolted to the ground is so they can't get chucked in the river anymore. So all I know is that ever since that thing was thrown in the river, Tigers have yet to win a championship. So got to find a way to put it behind us. I'd heard there was a, a, a thing about the colonel, but I didn't know what the story was until now. Thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. They fished it out of the river, actually. And they did? I think well, maybe almost 10 or so years ago, something like that. They, yeah, they found, well, they found what was left of it in the river and fished it out. They were hoping it would help, and it hasn't yet, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> well, they got back to the Japan series, and yeah, we did. 2015 just didn't yeah. win any games. Oh, we won one now. Come on. We won the first one of that series at home. At Coach right. and, and, and then, then we had the crazy finish to it and, and when, when we had a uh, runner interference right. down the line at first base to end the, the World Series, the Nippon Series of Japan. And no one knew, no one knew the game was over and then Sarfate just starts jumping around. Yeah. Yes, anyway. <laughs> okay, let's see. We have a question from Gabe in Toronto. The question is regarding North American minor leaguers and their career opportunities in MPB. With MLB actively trying to shrink its minor league system, MPB is going to get a bumper crop of foreign players to sign. Do you think MPB teams are ready to take advantage of that? Bobby, that seems like maybe a question for you. No, the, the, yeah, the players that, yeah, the players that are being cut in the U.S. could not cut it in Japan. You know, they're, they're, they're cutting out the lower minor league levels. And, uh, you know, there's a limit on how many 
foreign players you could have in Japan. So those players aren't the ones that are going to benefit. Uh, the players that are getting cut are, are – it's a sad situation, you know. And, and um, I was in Japan trying to get the Japanese teams to get more minor league teams to develop more of their players because Koshien is so great. The, the, the country loves baseball so much. But this idea of players leaving here because they're getting – cut from the minor leagues to play in Japan, that just isn't happening. It's, it's a high level of play, folks, a very high level of play. And for Matt to get 214 hits at that level, that young man is one hell of a hitter. Let me tell you. Does anyone else have any thoughts about that, the minor league system or let's see, I think we had another question about the minor league system here. <clears throat> also about the minor league system okay. that Bobby's idea of expanding it is something that when when he said it people were kind of like we kind of poo-pooed it a little bit I don't know why but the Giants have since taken it on and the Hawks have since taken it on so they now have a third level of the minor leagues for those two teams yeah 10 years later Jace <laughs> yeah yeah, and I obviously with that, I mean, I'll make it quick. I have opinions. I don't know how much of those opinions you should share. I do think that the one thing the NPB could do better um, is in respect to uh, the Players Association. Um, that could be a little stronger, and I think there's an opportunity for uh, the game to be marketed probably a little bit more so. Uh, the way we run our uh, – the way they do it in the MLB offices here, and, the, and we have the MLB app, and we have the platforms in terms of – uh, you know, the, the web and everything. And I know they're working that way there, but I just, I think if you look back at the game and I looked at it at one point uh, and I don't know how long ago, it could have been when Bobby was there. I don't quite remember, but at one point uh, in terms of the total worth of the league itself, the MLB and the NPB at one point were pretty close to one another and the MLB has taken off exponentially. And I feel like part of that is kind of the NPB has remained in this kind of same pattern and they haven't utilized the opportunity to market. Like Bobby said, they, and Jason's very aware of it, he's been there a, a long time. They love the game, uh, the people follow it. I mean, you can go into the Tiger store and you can outfit your entire home in Tiger's gear. If you want curtains, you can get curtains. If you want pillows, you can get pillows. It doesn't matter what it is. So the people love the game. I do think there's an opportunity to build it out as Bobby's mentioned. And part of that would be how they market it, get people more involved in the lower levels and following these players all the way to the top level. And they, I think it's possible. I just think it would take some change in how it's been done for a long time. Well, let's see, we're, we're about at the top of the hour here, but I didn't get a chance to ask this earlier and I'm just gonna throw it out in case someone has um, a favorite story or a favorite anecdote, uh, anecdote about baseball in Japan or, or being gaijin in Japan. Anyone have any good stories to tell us? I have one. I don't can't do it in a brief way. <laughs> I'll say mine really quickly. First day, spring camp, we get there. There's a million things going on. Stretches 45 minutes long. You have three cages on the field to take batting practice instead of one. That was totally different. But we go in for lunch, and it was my first day and we walk in and everybody's in line and, and and when you're a foreigner in another country you kind of just look around and you eyeball everything and so that's why we love going to a buffet at first because we really don't know what to say or how to say it so we just go where we can see it and we can grab it and we move on so i'm watching the guys and they're in line to get what was udon or ramen and i don't remember specifically which one it was but they were there to get their their bowl of, of noodles and so i got my bowl and i went to sit down well the basis of these bowls of noodles is broth. So to me, it was a soup. So I go to sit down as a new foreigner in Japan and I grab my spoon and I'm sitting over there with my spoon trying to eat my, let's just say it was ramen because I don't remember specifically, but let's say I was eating my ramen with the spoon and everybody's staring at me. I'm like, what in the world's going on right now? And they said, oh, somebody tasked me and they go, oh, by the way, here in Japan, that's called ramen and we eat it with chopsticks. So I was like, oh, okay. So I got a real, you know, those are one of those things as a foreigner, you just, oh, that looks like soup to me. I'm going to eat it with a spoon. You come to find out it's just not how it's done, you know. Six years later, you're still running into the same issue, differing ways. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, 
I guess we're at the top of the hour. If there's nothing burning, um, I should probably pass this back to, to Paul. Yes. Well, uh, thank you so much, Yuri Ko. And uh, thank you to all our distinguished panelists and obviously our moderator, Yuri Ko, for this evening's program. We greatly appreciate your time and willingness to share. And we'd also like to express our gratitude to everyone who attended the program and for your eagerness to learn more about the importance of baseball within the U.S.-Japan relationship. We, we had a lot of amazing questions and we do apologize that we could not get to all of those. I think we had probably 35 or 40 questions and we could only address a handful. Before we close, we also hope that you can join some upcoming programs. And I know we're gonna have um, some, uh, great. I think just, it's gonna go. We're gonna have a, uh, yeah. So tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern, I think it should come up just in a moment. Um, let me just share while it's coming up. Um, tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern, Japan American Society Dallas-Fort Worth will have a fr family-friendly program following siblings Natsuo and Natsuko on a journey during a typical summer day in Japan, starting with morning exercises, then playing fun games at a festival, trying special Japanese food served through the warm weather, and ending with a fireworks celebration. Tomorrow evening, Japan American Society Dallas-Fort Worth will host an event on Japanese government leadership, as you can see the, the flyer there, uh, during COVID-19, this will be leadership during COVID-19, and the impact for relations within the US. Next week, uh, August 19th, the Japan American Society will have an event on Japanese health and wellness, featuring a noted medical professional and a representative from E2N North America, which is located in Brooklyn, as well as a corporate member of both uh, uh, JES, DFW, and Japan Society. Although there is not an image on your screen on August 25th, so that's coming up in a couple weeks, the Japan American Society of Dallas-Fort Dallas Worth will also have an event on air travel today and tomorrow in partnership with the Japan America Society of Georgia. Finally, on the evening of September, or sorry, September 2nd, the uh, DFW chapter will have its first ever virtual Otsukimi Moon Viewing Festival, which will include performances from professional shamisen and kota musicians, community groups in Sendai, Japan, a dango cooking demonstration, and commercials from Japanese restaurants in North Texas. Additionally, our friends in New York at Japan Society will present a robust lineup of virtual programs this fall, which will include engaging arts and cultural productions, video programs connecting influential global leaders, and immersive learning experiences for people of all ages. Registration is now open for fall online Japanese courses covering 13 levels from beginner to advanced. Please check our websites, which would be japansociety.org and jasdfw.org for more information and regular updates as we schedule events throughout the summer and into the fall. We kindly ask that you complete the post-event survey, which will pop up in your browser once the program ends. This concludes today's event. Thank you for attending. Have a wonderful rest of the evening for our U.S. attendees and a great rest of the day for those in Japan.